We're about to send the colorful metaphors out of some Star Trek, but believe it or not, we at CinemaSins actually love Star Trek. So much so that we made a new CinemaSins podcast called Captain's Pod. A show where the CinemaSins crew can review, sin, and talk about everything Star Trek. So whether you're new to Star Trek, a lifelong Trekkie, or anything in between, join us on the USS Enterprise by searching for Captain's Pod or CinemaSins in your podcast player of choice. Until then, enjoy the video and live, live long, long and prosper. In case you confused it with Nimbus 3 Montana. This guy seems to be looking around fairly normally, so does that mean he's seeing the horse in slow motion as well? I can't believe you'd kill me for a field of empty holes. If history tells us one thing, it's that men have done far worse for far fewer holes. A starship? There are no starships on Nimbus 3. Perhaps I have a way to bring one here. I mean, this does kind of end up working out for Cybok, but goddamn, why wouldn't he at least go to a planet where he had more than one f***ing option? I remember thinking the biggest bunch of bullshit fan service any Star Trek film did was Banana Float Crumple Snatch dramatically announcing he was Khan in Star Trek Into Darkness to a bunch of characters that had zero clue who he was. However, Cybok showing his ears so we know he's got something to do with Spock, but discount Michael Berryman just thinks, oh, he's Vulcan, all right, is a close runner-up. Also, what the f*** was any of that? Am I supposed to know who these people are? Where are the whales? Where are my stars? Oh. Well, sh**. 62 seconds of mass starvationary opening credits. Would it have really been that big of a deal to give the rest of the main cast from the television series equal starring credit with Shatner, Nimoy, and Kelly? Get the f*** out of here with this co-starring bullshit. In case you confused it, with Yosemite National Park Tatooine. In a Star Trek film directed by William Shatner, our introduction to any of the Enterprise crew is a shot of Shatner's ass. Somehow that actually checks out. Movie has time for three full minutes of someone in a Halloween mask climbing El Capitan. When does the trekking of the stars happen? You'll have a great time, Bonds. You'll enjoy your shore leave. Well, at least this time you're not getting chased around by a giant bunny rabbit, so that's a plus, right? Which reminds me that an episode of TOS where Bones is chased around by a giant bunny rabbit is so much better than this movie, and I feel a sin hippity hopping its way to us right now. Greetings, Captain. Either these boots are so loud that Kirk should have heard Spock's entire ascent, or Spock is a total dick for jump scaring Kirk while he's free climbing. I'm gonna send both and blame it on quantum fluctuations in the flux simpacitor. Hi, Bones! Mind if we drop in for dinner? If this is the kind of joke you enjoy, then you're in luck. Star Trek V will be your favorite movie of all time. Take me down to the paradox city where the women are cats and they have three titties. Oh, won't you? Also, I almost want to congratulate the film for ripping off the tri-boob character from Total Recall a full year before its release. Almost. Hey, Harv, we need a game for the aliens to play on Nimbus 3. Hmm, okay, Bill, what about a literal pool table? But the balls have to roll through what looks like watered-down semen. Harv, you're a genius. One of the many, many reasons that make The Undiscovered Country a better movie is that it doesn't waste its casting of David Warner. Heck, even TNG did a better job. You had David f***ing Warner and you blew it, Final Frontier. You blew it! There are four cents! Cigarettes are apparently still a thing 300 years in the future. My charming companion here is the thing on console, cord. <laughs> For anyone who thought Worf bumping his head in Star Trek Insurrection was the lowest common denominator for Klingon humor, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, would like you to hold its Romulan ale. Twenty years ago, our three governments agreed to develop this planet together. Captain, she cannot take any more! Prepare for emergency exposition, dump. Nimbus 3, the planet of peace and unity, welcomes all species, as long as they can read English. Prisoners? We're already prisoners here on this worthless lump of rock! That's Nimbus 3 -ist. And once again, the Excelsior is in f***ing space dock. I'm beginning to think the ship was commissioned specifically to hide the Enterprise for these dramatic reveals. I think this new ship was put together by monkeys. While Scotty would definitely think something like this and maybe say it to co-workers, I don't buy for a second he would say this in an official Federation log. It's like everyone involved thought it was really cool that they completely changed the character of Han Solo into a lovable goofball in Return of the Jedi and were damn determined to do that to every Enterprise crew member in this movie. Oh, Huda, I thought you were on leave. As poorly as she's used in this movie, that probably would have been better for Nichelle Nichols. Red, red, red. Alert. Red. I just fixed that damn thing. Surely it's beneath the chief engineer of the goddamn Enterprise to be fixing a warning alarm. Delegate, Mr. Scott. Don't you have a nephew that could be doing this? Red alert. This is a red alert. Enterprise acknowledge. 
I can't think of a single damn time Starfleet has made contact by saying red alert. Why would you open with something that could so easily be confused with an actual bridge alarm? The ship's in pieces and we've got less than a skeleton crew aboard. I will never understand why Trek writers think we won't be invested in the story unless the Enterprise is in pieces and under crude. And since it's barely even mentioned in the rest of the movie, why can't we just have a nice Enterprise to play with? And now begins six minutes of Kirk, McCoy, and Spock eating beans, drinking whiskey, and singing Row, Row, Row Your Boat. This movie wastes so much time. It does have a flavoring I'm not familiar with. Aha, that's the secret ingredient. Secret ingredients! Tell me what I'm putting in my mouth, damn it. Whiskey. Tennessee whiskeys. I'm not sure if it's refreshing or sad that in the 23rd century, Tennessee will be most notable for its production of whiskey. I've always known. I'll die alone. And what an amazing and honorable character death that will be if the franchise ever decides to kill him. An inspiration for generations of Trek fans, I'm sure. A marshmallow. Well, I'll be there. A marshmallow. I thought I was losing my goddamn mind, but Spock does say Marshmelon here, and nobody acknowledges it. Apparently some version of the script had McCoy fucking with a library computer in Spock's room and getting it to misspell Marshmallow, because somehow he knew Spock would be researching camping, and because haha, -ha, that'd be hilarious. But none of that shit was even filmed, so how did this make the final cut? Pioneer 10 was launched in 1973, and by this time, presuming it continued on uninterrupted, would have ended up somewhere like 800 AU away from Earth, or 0.012 of a light year. All that to say, this is super super f***ing close to Federation space and Earth for a Klingon bird of prey to be attempting f***ing target practice. What ta da on on what revolution on Raj, go do kitaj. Nech bej divi. But how is Claw this certain of that happening? Just because Talbot is a human, Claw can't know for sure that he's a priority for the Federation to come to the rescue. Character actions in this movie rely way too much on the ability to foreshadow enemy plans that could just as easily not happen. Just because they all do happen the way they are predicted doesn't make them any less bullshit. Why didn't you beep my communicator? You forgot to take it with you. I can believe that Kirk would leave his communicator behind. I could even buy that Bones would do the same. But there isn't a Ferengi's chance in Vegas that Spock would have left his behind as well. Also, Kirk went f***ing free climbing with no method of communication in case, you know, Spock wasn't there to ex machina him. And despite his protests, so did McCoy! Fun fact, Leonard Nimoy had no idea the cameras were rolling at this point. This was just his expression for 90% of production. It is the 23rd century and apparently we still need to use f***ing removable steps to disembark from a shuttlecraft. There must be other ships in the quadrant. Other ships, yes but no experienced commanders. Imagine trying so hard to avoid the Enterprise as the only available ship cliche that you don't see yourself falling into the gravitational well of Shatner's ego, thereby creating an even dumber contrivance to get the plot going. Also, what has happened to Starfleet to make Kirk the only captain capable of dealing with a hostage situation? Since when was he a f***ing qualified hostage negotiator? Also, also, if you're so strapped for experienced officers, why have you stacked the ones you do have all on the same damn ship? I'd ask who was crewing Excelsior, but it clearly doesn't matter since the damn thing never leaves space dock. Your orders are to proceed to Nimbus 3. It has taken 30 minutes to get to the start of this movie. To pray. Ah. Star Trek movie has a Klingon character with a hard-on for killing Kirk cliche. What is going on with this hostage tape, and why does it have more imaginative camera work than the movie it's inside of? You look like you've just seen a ghost. Perhaps I have, Captain. But I shall choose to withhold any further information until we have moved to a far more dramatic and moody location. Much better. Who is it he reminds you of? There was a young student. Exceptionally gifted. Spock's position! Transporter room, stands. Transporter is still in operative. You mean the transporters that could wrap up this mission in seconds aren't working? How did Shatner come up with such original brilliance? No one has an issue with the captain and first officer of an already limited crew leading this extremely dangerous rescue mission. Most of the special effects in Star Trek movies are handled by the legendary Industrial Light and Magic, with the glaring exception of this movie, which was entrusted with the same company that worked on Little Shop of Horrors. That's all I really need to say about that. Then it's fortunate that I have you and your starship to protect me. Fortunate? It's downright ridiculous that this was Cybok's plan. He wants to lure in a ship by kidnapping diplomats from the three most powerful races in the galaxy. But this only works if the ship being sent doesn't have transporters. What if the Enterprise wasn't in pieces? What if the Romulans or Klingons turned up first? Wait a minute. Perfect. Kirk said convenient horses are convenient, strangely. Yeah. She make I can't work out what's more jaw-dropping here, that Kirk asked Uhura to do this, that Shatner asked Nichols to do this, or that both the Enterprise crew and the movie crew were okay with this. Also, where is the music coming from? Why is Uhura even on this away mission? This movie is dumb. Hello, boys. The power of boners, man. The only true universal constant. Phasers on stun! Whoa, Nelly. What happened to... Assess the situation. 
and avoid a confrontation if possible. As usual, Kirk seems to have interpreted that as shoot first and dodge the court-martial later. It wasn't bloodshed I wanted! Considering that we're about to find out what Cybok does in fact want, cliched bloodshed probably would have made for a better movie. Did Spock just Vulcan net pinch a horse? I'm pretty sure Spock just Vulcan net pinched a horse. Kirk is addicted to this establishment's neon signage for no discernible reason. Kirk wanders into this bar completely alone with no idea as to how many reinforcements Cybok has or basically any kind of fucking clue what's waiting for him. <laughs> Kirk throws the cat lady into a shallow pool and assumes she's dead. There's no way she should be dead. Go get her out of there! What happened to setting the phasers to stun? Spock. Cybok's journey of discovery continues to warp the very fabric of all that is likely and probable by managing to lure in the one ship in the entire universe that is carrying his estranged half-brother. Position bird of prey. Closing. You think? Fairly certain he wanted something slightly more specific than they're still there. They're only cloaking now. Why weren't they cloaked already? The Klingons are always cloaked. Did Shatner watch any Star Trek before making this movie? Once we've taken control of your vessel, we'll bring up the rest of our followers. How do they expect to overpower even the skeleton crew of the Enterprise with just the followers they could fit into the shuttle? Especially when five of those slots are taken by Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Uhura, and Sulu. Stand by to execute emergency landing plan B. What's emergency landing plan B? Kirk's plan is to bring the shuttle in without using the Enterprise's tractor beam, which isn't actually that wild of an idea. In fact, wouldn't this be the next logical alternative if the tractor beam broke down? Hell, why is this barricade even here if this maneuver is as outrageous as everyone seems to think? Also, the dangerous part of this plan isn't the landing or the barricade. It's Sulu apparently jumping the shuttle to warp goddamn nine for the approach. Meanwhile, on Star Trek The Animated Series. So Kirk and Spock said, To get us inside and re-raise the shields will take Exactly, 15.5 seconds. Which was apparently way too long and risky to attempt. Well, in plan B, the shields were down for a total of 14 seconds, assuming they were immediately raised when the shuttle landed, and all it took was Sulu nearly killing everyone on the shuttle and taking half the Enterprise with them in the process to gain that one second. Worth it? Kirk, Spock, and McCoy chose to f***ing stand for this maneuver? We must change course. At once. I hear you, man, but we're already at the 50 minute mark, so let's just write this off to experience and bring Meyer back for the next one, okay? You must kill me. Or shoot him in the leg. I'll probably do it too. The bad guy decides to keep the main characters all in the same brig, instead of separating them. Fortunately, they'll spend the majority of their time arguing about Spock not murdering a family member, instead of actually trying to escape. If I had pulled the trigger, Cybok would be dead. Unless you shot him in the goddamn leg! F Cybok also is a son of Sarek. Spock has a sibling no one knew about, cliche. Honestly, this happening twice is f***ing bizarre. You mean he's your brother, brother? I really thought there was a line from the song Miss Jackson by Outkast that rhymed with brother, brother, like mother, mother. But after five minutes of scouring through the video, I realized I was thinking of forever, ever. And then this led me on a 23 minute rabbit hole of Cobra Starship songs. Don't ask. But in total, I spent 28 minutes trying to come up with a sin for this ridiculous bit of dialogue. And now I have bring it snakes on a plane stuck in my head for the rest of the day. Are you happy, Star Trek V? I have so many questions about why this toilet can't be used in space dock and no desire to have them answered. Why is Cybok on a different turbo lift than Sulu and Uhura? Why are there two different access points to turbo lifts on the bridge? Why didn't Leighton Meester have a bigger singing career after singing with Cobra Starship on the hit song Good Girls Go Bad? I have so many questions. This is the new brig, Captain. It is escape proof. How do you know? The designers tested it using the most intelligent and resourceful person they could find. This is, of course, Spock talking about himself, and obviously Spock is very smart, but I still don't understand why the designers would use him. Why wouldn't you use someone that has already escaped a break? They could use either a former criminal turned good, or whatever this century's version of Sylvester Stallone's escape plan character is. They made love with their hearts. I'm not here to judge alien mating rituals, but this seems like a very messy and unnecessarily dangerous way to pawn your farce. My brothers, we have been chosen to undertake the greatest adventure of all time. Greatest adventure? Really? Bill and Ted got to collect history's greatest minds and leaders like action figures. Indiana Jones found the fucking Ark of the Covenant in the Holy Grail. Lawrence of Arabia, well, he did something. I've never actually watched all of that movie, but I always tell people I have because those LOA fans be passionate. Well, shit, now I've admitted it to everyone. Are you happy, Star Trek V? Is what possible? That he's found Shakari. The reason Cyborg left Vulcan. Spock f***ing knew this was his plan, and he's only sharing it now? He's making a goddamn intergalactic Olympic sport out of burying the lead. Which lies beyond the Great Barrier. At the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy. Where Shakari is fabled to exist. So if Shakira is fabled to be in the center of the galaxy, why is Spock so shocked that Cybok knows where to go? He hasn't found sh**. He's just following a myth that everyone apparently already knows. Believe 
It is a primitive form of communication known as Morse code. If the Federation no longer practices Morse code, why does the person currently using it think Spock, Kirk, and Bones will understand what message they are trying to communicate to them? C. K. Back. Stand back. Stand back. Also, despite only translating half the Morse code taps, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy get the entire message. Fortunately, the missing taps spelled out, don't worry, I'll wait until you start translating before starting the actual message. Also, also, what's the point of a stand back warning if you only give them four seconds to stand back? Especially when you haven't got a clue if they've even heard or understood the message. What are you standing around for? Do you not know a jailbreak when you see one? Scream it a bit louder, Scotty. I don't think they quite heard you around the moons of Nibia. I know this ship like the back of my hand. <laughs> I'll admit, this scene cracked me up when I was a kid, and as a result, it still gets a chuckle out of me now, but it's dumb. Dumb! Scotty isn't dumb! Could you imagine this shit happening in the Wrath of Khan? And it adds nothing to the plot. Scotty will briefly be in sickbay, and then we'll be inexplicably back helping Kirk before the end of the movie. I believe I found a faster way. Spock likes these surprise arrivals so much he managed to pull his anti-grav boots out of his ass, found an alternative route to their end destination that Scotty apparently doesn't know about that allowed him to beat Kirk and McCoy to the top, all so that he could descend down this original shaft to surprise them. We do not have time for your green-blooded shenanigans! The people of your planet once believed their world was flat. The question is, at what point between now and the year 2279 can we actually start using this sentence ourselves? Wait outside. They already are outside the door. Unless Cybok means outside outside, in which case they would be dead. I'm here. I'm with your dad. Look, I'm always happy to see McCoy given more to sink his teeth into, but couldn't we have trimmed this down slightly and got to see what Sulu, Uhura, or Chekhov's hidden pain was? This pain has poisoned your soul for a long time. This movie has poisoned me and many other Trek fans for a long time. I feel like Bone should suffer with the rest of us. What is this? I believe we are witnessing my birth. I understand that this would be the genesis of Spock's pain, but if this process is about unveiling trauma, why are we seeing something he couldn't possibly remember? Isn't it more likely to be an actual conversation he had from his youth? I have found myself and my place. I know who I am. And I cannot go with you. We get a beautiful speech from Spock explaining why he can resist Cybok's brainwashing and why he can't go with him. All we get from McCoy is... I guess you better count me out, too. And it's almost impressive how much this one line manages to undercut the power of what Spock shared and the willpower of the entire damn crew who couldn't resist. Mr. Sulu, full ahead. We get zero explanation for why the Enterprise is able to survive this trip. What was blowing up all the probes? So, Frank, how exactly are we going to show the Great Barrier when they get to it? Well, George, remember that acid trip we took by watching the 1978 version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers? And while watching the opening credits, we thought we were pollinating our own minds with the spores and that seven babies would just pop out of our heads? Of course, I'll never forget that. Well, I'm going for a visualization of that, but I'm painting it blue. Why blue, Frank? Fuck if I know, George, I'm on acid currently. Are we dreaming? Sadly, no. All this bullshit is canon. We can't play it, but trust me when I say that this is the most unearned use of the iconic Star Trek theme ever. And I don't mean just to date, I mean in perpetuity. I don't care if one day it ends up scoring the reveal of a new and improved Millennium Falcon, it will still be less jarring than this bullshit. Shakari. Q. E2. For Tavor. Excitement? Michelle Nichols is standing right f***ing there and you can give her one of these lines. It's not like a casting Donna Murphy instead of letting Gates McFadden have the emotional moments with Picard and Star Trek Insurrection kind of bullshit. But not only does Star Trek V ignore half of the crew for the majority of the runtime, when they do give them something to do, it's embarrassing as f***. Cybok, Spock, Dr. McCoy, come with me. Kirk says he wants to handle this by the book and then invites Cybok, his f***ing kidnapper, to go on the away mission with him. What book is he going by? Because that decision can't be part of the Starfleet book. The land, the sky. Just as I knew it would be. You mean you knew it would look like a Californian desert with a Parma violet filter? Seems oddly specific if you ask me. What the hell is recording this footage? The shuttlecraft is right there. Why not make it from its point of view and save yourself a sin? Scotty, you gotta see this. You better come take a look at this cliche. No trek is complete without it. I mean, this is literally the same transporter room and corridors from the next generation. What did they spend the 33 million on? Did they actually hire God? What kind of ass backwards security system would prioritize a written recommendation over a definitely audible alarm? Enterprise, uh, this is Kirk. Uh, we have a. Uh... Unfinished script? Believe it or not, these ridiculous shock erections are only 10% as bonkers as what Shatner originally proposed for the finale. I'm not saying it would have saved the film by any means, but the budget cuts mid-production certainly didn't do it any favors.
Good thing no one was standing on the parts of the ground where the sh** was shooting up from. Could say God was watching. I mean, you shouldn't say that because it's ludicrous, but you could. Brave souls. Welcome. The sequence packs about as much suspense as a ride at Epcot. This feels like a bullshit add-on to Spaceship Earth that would have been removed from the exhibit after a couple of years that they would just add Nemo to it. What does God need with a starship? This line has become iconic enough in the history of Star Trek that I will begrudgingly take a sin off. I guess. When you speak of me to future generations, if you could leave the part out where I removed a sin from Star Trek V, I would appreciate it. I couldn't help but notice your pain. My pain? It runs deep. Share it with me! <laughs> what? This super being entity thing is physically there? Cybok duplicate just apparated out of nowhere. Could it have just disappeared again? What is Cybok grabbing onto here? Enterprise, are you ready? In firing position. Torpedo armed. Kirk's ingenious plan is to fire a torpedo at the super being entity thing, which is dumb, but you know what, I'm sure it'll fucking work, because what does God need with a cohesive plot anyway? Please tell me the transporter is working. She's got partial power, so I might be able to take two of you. Well, that's what you get for tying the transporter buffers directly into the third act climax deregulator. Now, just a day. McCoy's vocal cords still work while being deconstructed into their constituent atoms and beamed through space. Also non-consensual transporting. The Klingons are here, too. They need to rename that thing the Galactic Revolving Door for all the good it's doing barring entry. <laughs> Looks like God went to the Icarus from Eternal School of Missing While Aiming with Your Eye Lasers. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's hard to be intimidated by a growl that sounds like he stepped on a Lego. Wait, why is Kirk cheering here? He has no idea that the Bird of Prey is on his side. I bet Shatner was hoping this shockingly bad green screen was going to cover the fact that he forgot which ship was meant to be appearing. That might feel like a stretch, but I'm just trying to keep up with the theme of the movie. My junior officer has something he wants to say to you. I apologize. This decorated general dishonors his fellow Klingon by making him do the most un-Klingon thing possible. Apologize. This is the perfect illustration of why this movie doesn't work. The contrivance of events strung together by dad jokes and a bafflingly poor grasp of the source material. Please, Captain. Not in front of the Klingons. Okay, fine. I'll take a sin off for this too, but purely because I feel like I owe this specific line some sort of royalty check for the amount of times I use it to get out of awkward public displays of affection. One of the biggest crimes of this movie is that it takes Chekhov and Sulu and makes them clueless buffoons in the first act, zombie buffoons in the second act, and lecherous buffoons in the finale. What a waste. According to this view, they are apparently having this shindig while still beyond the galactic barrier. Do they not need to report back to Starfleet and tell them the hostages are safe? The Enterprise is no longer being commanded by a zealot and God has been torpedoed? I lost a brother once. I was lucky I got him back. Because f you, Samuel Kirk. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. No, 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 no. Oh, your guy. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. You're a Vulcan! <laughs> An astute observation has led to laughter! <laughs> we are laughing! Hi, Bones! Mind if we drop in for dinner? That was not funny! Romulan. Terran. Klingon. Are you just looking at things in the office and saying that you love them? Prisoners? We're already prisoners here on this worthless lump of rock! This is City Alpha 5! Good night, Doctor. Good night, Spock. Good night, Ned. Uhura, I had the strangest dream. But it wasn't a dream. It was a place. And you, and you, and you, and you were there. thousand years will give you such a crick in the neck! Did you see what God just did to us, man? God didn't do that, you did it. So it's me you want to click on bastards. What are you waiting for? Damn you, God! Damn you all day!